the the options are the options are leave them cryogenically frozen in perpetuity, let them thaw and die, donate them to somebody else, or donate them to science. And quite honestly, none of those options is awesome, right? Because if you leave it cryogenically frozen, that means that this embryo just remains in arrested development forever. If you just let it thaw, it's a bit of a waste, right? If you donate it to somebody else, somebody else is carrying around your child. And if you donate it to science, who the heck knows what's going to become of that fertile <laughs> embryo? But that's, that's really the source of embryonic stem cells, is those kinds of um, infertility treatments. Yeah. So how do um, designer babies happen? Like what? That is a wonderful how does... question. <laughs> so designer babies, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, uh, are children that you dictate the genetic code to. So for example, you could design a child to have blonde hair and blue eyes if you wanted. Which is pretty crazy, right? But we have the technology to do that. There is a technology called CRISPR, and hopefully at some point we'll be able to talk about CRISPR technology. But it's basically a gene editing software where you inject yourself or some tissue with this little genetic code and it finds the right region of the DNA and changes the alleles to be what you want them to be. Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever seen the movie Gattaca? It's an older movie back from like the 90s. Ethan Hawke's in it. <laughs> He's hunky. Uh, so watch that movie at some point. That is a reality. We can do that. We can design children to be what we want them to be. Which is rad, right? Because who's going to want to have a child that has cystic fibrosis? Who's going to want to have a child who's going to want their child to have cystic fibrosis is a better way to ask the question. Who's going to want their child to be susceptible to some types of cancer? If you had the ability to make it so that your child never had to contend with cancer, wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah, but I think some people take it too far, though. Yeah, like, oh, some I people are like, I just want my child to look exactly like this. Okay. And, instead of, like, being like, oh, I don't want them to have a certain disease. Or, like, some people, um, I've heard of some people, like, designing babies to use them for, like, kind of, like, it sounds terrible for, like, parts for children that they have that yeah. are already sick. Yeah, for sure. That's There's a book about that, right? Yeah, My Sister's Keeper. Yeah, My Sister's Keeper, which is a crazy book. But right. does it, um... Like epigenetics have to do with that too, because like environment, even though they can create it, but the environment factors can still change. For sure. What happens to that? Because the genetic code is identical. Sorry, so I'm thinking about something different. Um, yeah, epigenetics could affect that. So we're throwing caution a little bit to the wind. There are some gene regions, however, that we know are more susceptible to DNA methylation than others. Um, but two cloned individuals won't necessarily be physiologically or phenotypically identical because of that DNA methylation uh, process. So what Marissa mentioned is true, right? I mean, the question isn't whether or not the technology is good. The question is, where do we draw the line? And is it necessarily bad to design a child that has blonde hair and blue eyes? <laughs> like, why do you want to change your child like that, you know? Like, I mean, I would change my child if it was, like, going to be more susceptible to cancer or something sure. like that, you know? But, like, I don't want to be like, wow, like, my child's going to have, like, an ugly nose, so I'm going to change the nose, you know? Yeah, like, I do. I know exactly child. what you're saying. But think about the inherent double standard that we introduce when we start making those kinds of decisions, right? What we're saying, if, if we decide that we want to design our children, we're, uh, we are making decisions for another individual, basically, what that individual is going to, to look like and perhaps to some extent act like. But aren't there other industries where we don't do that? Think about the tobacco industry. We let people smoke if they want. Is that a good decision or a bad decision? Physically, it's a bad decision, but why do we make it? Why do we make that available to individuals? And I can tell you the reason is economics. And couldn't we make the same exact argument for designer children? Could you think about how lucrative that industry would be? It would be great for the economy, which sounds like a really callous thing to say. 
but it's true. Living in a capitalistic society, those are the kinds of decisions that we're compelled to make. So does it make it immoral? No, it just makes it different. Right? Okay. Yeah, Darby. Question. So where I work, we like will draw blood on a horse into this procedure called like IRAP. Is that like the same thing as like stem cell? Like you put it in like their joints if they're like lame? I don't know what IRAP is, but oh, I know okay. that those kinds of stem cell treatments mm -hmm. are common, where you can take what are called adult stem cells that will develop into a restricted number of cell types, and it definitely helps with with uh, cellular regeneration. So it could definitely be. Yeah, Emery. So like, I probably have a bad thing. It's like, if all this had happened, like, what if we get like really overpopulated though? Like, sure. I mean, we have we have the technology to make it so that our lifespan increases significantly, for sure. And you know, really, this this is an aside we probably shouldn't talk about. Really, if you look at human uh, population growth, the problem really isn't the rate of reproduction, because uh, rates of reproduction globally have been decreasing for a long time. Really, the problem is how long people, have I already said this, how long people are living. It's the introduction of westernized healthcare right, that's really increasing the age of individuals. And that becomes problematic because it's okay for us to say, use protection, have fewer children. It's a lot more difficult for us to come to somebody and say, you've lived long enough. It's time for you, it's time for you to go. You know what I mean? So yeah, Amory, that is a significant problem. Doesn't that also take out um, genetic variation and um natural selection though because if we're designing all of our babies to be a certain way like we're not letting we're not letting nature do what it's got to do and that is absolutely one of the arguments the counter argument is our ability to develop those technologies isn't that a product of natural selection <laughs> yeah it's, it's really interesting topic I wish that we had more time to talk about it. Yeah, Carly. Okay, this kind of does slightly back on what Arnie was saying. My uncle was doing research with stem cells and using the you know, like joint surgery. He's a joint surgeon. Like okay. He does. And he and his buddies did research on that. So they'd use those adult stem cells? They could, yep. They definitely could. And adult stem cells are a lot easier to get, lots less controversial. So, like, um, cord blood is taken a lot at the point of birth, when babies are born, blood will be drawn from uh, the umbilical cord, and that's a source of adult stem cells. You guys have adult stem cells in your bone marrow, because your bone marrow won't produce just more bone marrow cells, but it'll produce more bone marrow cells, it'll produce white blood cells, it'll produce red blood cells, a whole host of things. So there, and, and there's some optic cells, I believe, that are also adult stem cells. So yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. So what we can do is we can look at, I have time to talk about pedigrees? Yes. What do I have here? No, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna skip pedigrees. What I wanted to show you is that with a pedigree, you can determine whether or not something is sex-linked or whether it's dominant or recessive with respect to disorders. And really what I wanna do is jump ahead a little bit and talk about some genetic disorders. Okay, so let's skip pedigree, this won't be on the exam, but the next bit of stuff will be. So there are some genetic disorders <coughs> uh, that are both dominant or recessive and sex linked, and so we're going to talk about disorders that fit all of those criteria. Hemophilia is a really, really good example of a sex linked uh, genetic disorder. One of the phenomena associated with sex-linked disorders is that they're much more common among males than they are among females. For that same reason that guys don't have a homologous gene on a homologous chromosome, right? Because we have one Y chromosome, and if that gene happens to be on the Y chromosome, and it's messed up, there's no other Y chromosome to compensate for that problem. Likewise, if it's on the X chromosome, you don't have anything to compensate for it. So things like colorblindness, more common in males than females, because that's a sex-linked character. So hemophilia is like bleeding out, and there are actually two genes that are located on the X chromosome 
that determine whether or not an individual will be hemophilic whether or not it's likely that if they get a significant cut, they'll be unable to clot and stop the bleeding. Now, there are two gene regions, right, on the X chromosome, which means that if males inherit either one of those gene regions that's faulty, that male will be hemophilic. Females, you're covered again because you have a second X chromosome, right, which means that at least 50% of your X chromosomes will be producing the correct sort of protein to initiate clotting. It, it wouldn't surprise me. In fact, many of the Romanoff line probably had it because we know that among royals there's a significant problem with inbreeding and inbreeding depression and those kinds of recessive disorders can become fixed in a population. Okay, so a recessive disorder that's controlled by a single gene locus is sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is interesting for lots of reasons, right? One is it shows the phenomenon of pleiotropy, that we can have a mutation at one point in, in a gene that affects not only the shape of the protein, but a whole bunch of other phenotypic characteristics, like propensity towards clotting, heart attack, seizure, capacity to carry oxygen, things like that. So it's a, it's a pleiotropic character. Fundamentally though, what happens is there was a single nucleotide substitution event where one nucleotide was switched to another nucleotide, which coded for a single different amino acid within a long protein. But that single amino acid substitution changed the shape of the protein. And ultimately what we get is red blood cells that look sickle shaped instead of normal shaped. Now, one of the other reasons that this is interesting is because it has evolutionary implications. Individuals that are homozygous recessive for sickle cell anemia, all of their blood cells look like this. And that sucks because they can't carry oxygen very well. They can't be aerobically active for nearly as long as individuals that have some concentration of normal red blood cells. So regardless of where they live, these guys are always at a disadvantage. In areas where there is no malaria, individuals that are uh, homozygous dominant, that all of their red blood cells look like this, um, have an advantage because they are maximally aerobically active, right? They can carry as much oxygen as possible. And I should actually draw this cross up on the board. So for sickle cell anemia, we'll use the a letter to indicate this, these alleles. Capital A is normal. And lowercase a, this is sickle cell. So if we have individuals with these genotypes, This individual is maximally fit in an area without malaria. This individual is never fit because they can't carry very much oxygen. And these individuals that are heterozygous actually produce both types of cells. 50% of their cells look like this, and 50% of their cells look like that. These individuals are maximally fit in areas with malaria, and the reason is this. The malaria parasite is transmitted by mosquitoes, and it's a plasmodium, is what it's called. Uh, it's just like a little amoeboid type organism, like a little amoeba, that attaches and parasitizes red blood cells, highly oxygenated red blood cells. So if all of your red blood cells look like this, this is really, really good habitat for malaria parasite. So in malaria areas, individuals that are homozygous dominant are great food for, for malaria. Individuals, however, that have a mix of this and this are 
much less susceptible to malarial infestation because 50% of their red blood cells are insufficient. So these guys, there's a selective advantage to have 50% of your cells sickle cell shape in malaria areas. So all of these guys have all normal red blood cells. These guys have 50% red uh, normal and 50% sickle. These guys all have sickle. There was an exception to Mendelian genetics that explains that. It had to do with dominance. Do you remember what the exception was? Incomplete dominance? It's close to incomplete dominance. Codominance? Codominance, yeah, where both phenotypes are expressed independently of one another. So this is a codominant character. Okay. Interestingly, recessive disorders, things like Tay-Sachs disease, which is terminal, are much more difficult to get rid of in our population than dominant genetic disorders. And we need to ask ourselves why. So Tay-Sachs disease is a problem with lysosomes, right? We've talked about this a lot. Lysosomes and neurons, the lysosomes can't digest fats and so they become engorged and they destroy the shape of neural cells. That's Tay-Sachs disorder. And it's controlled by a single gene locus that shows complete dominance. Individuals that are either homozygous dominant or heterozygous are okay. It's only individuals that are homozygous recessive that express Tay-Sachs disease. Now, if we compare that to something like Huntington's disease, this is a neurodegenerative disease, very much like Alzheimer's. This is a cross-section of a brain that is normal and a brain that has Huntington's disease. And what you'll notice is that there are incredibly large open areas within the brain of individuals that contend with Huntington's disease. <clears throat> because the neurons like physically degenerate. You just you lose a lot of brain material. But that's a dominant disorder. So if this is Huntington's disease, who of these individuals express Huntington's disease? The big A's. Three-fourths, right? Yeah, everything that has a big A. 